ka light of the sea. <laughs> Bring the word of the Lord to live this word. Good morning, everyone. It was a wonderful time around the worship of the King this morning. And there been in the service where it was just continuous worship song after song, the sense of his presence, the, the freedom. There is freedom when we worship his name, when we worship in spirit and truth, we just come before him. And our sister read Psalm 46. I was asked to speak at my church's prayer meeting, and it was on Psalm 46. And I sought the Lord quietly, and I was spoke to my father beside me. I never preached the same sermon twice, but I feel in my heart that that is no coincidence because there is no such thing as coincidence when it comes to God. So I've changed my message. My message was, in, was John 11, Raised the Life, the story of Lazarus. But because of this morning, with your permission, we will look at Psalm 46. So if you have your Bible, will you turn with me, please, to Psalm 46. Psalm 46. And my message for Friday was entitled, The Song of Holy Confidence. And I'll keep it the same. For it is a song of holy confidence. And we'll read the entire chapter. And we'll focus on a few selected verses of that chapter. And we'll see where the Lord leads us this morning. Psalm 46. I read from the New King James Version of the Bible. And we'll read from verse 1. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains are shaking with its swelling, there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come and behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. God always blesses the reading of his inspired word and his beautiful word. Can we pray before we delve deeply into the word of God? Is that okay? Can we pray? Let's pray. Father, just thank you for the sense of your presence throughout the meeting. And Lord, I pray that you anoint me afresh by the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you that your mercy is new every morning. We thank you for the table. And Lord, how this table points us to you. So Lord, I pray that our eyes will be fixed on you, where we draw our confidence from. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This psalm, Psalm 46, begins... The second book of the Psalms, the Psalms are spread out into five books. So Psalm 46 begins the second Psalm, second book of the Psalter. Okay. John Calvin called the book of Psalms an anatomy of all parts of the soul. All the range of emotions are expressed. The Psalms weave an emotional fabric for the human soul. These inspired lyrics take us by the hand and train us in proper emotion. They lead us to emotional maturity. And can I say, church, that nothing leads us to emotional maturity than the trials of life. We all know that. Various experiences. Nevertheless, you already know this. But it's good to be reminded of this. Nevertheless, we need to be reminded constantly that all things work together for good. Not, there is no such thing as a coincidence. I found this this morning, and I find this in all parts of the Christian journey. 
<coughs> Notice the psalm says God, Elohim, the creator of the heavens and earth. Everything that you see around you, feel, breathe, touch, is our refuge and strength. Resh refuge is a beautiful word. It's a place of safety. And it's there we find and have our strength. There comes a time and our natural strength reaches its end. However, it is he who continues to give us his strength in the times of our weakness as we dwell in his refuge, in his security. I love the word refuge because if you read Psalm 57 verse 1, it says this, Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for my soul trusts in you, and in the shadow of your wings I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed. Until these calamities have passed. Modern translations have it until the storm has passed. Storms seem relentless and never ending, don't they? The relentless trial, the torment, the agony. But the storms pass. And a storm may seem like it had left a mess. But our God, the God I worship, the God this church worships and serves, is very good. He excels and is wonderful in taking the mess of the storm and turning it into a message, a message of hope, a message of triumph. J.C. Ryle writes, there is no such thing as chance, luck or accident in the Christian journey. Through this world, all is arranged and appointed by God. All things are working together for the believer's good. What a promise we have been given by God when we ponder and meditate on his word. Verse two, therefore, and I love how the psalmists are fond of their therefores, because having said previous, we will not fear. Spurgeon writes this, about this psalm. His poetry is no poetic rapture without reason. It is a logical as mathematical demonstration. The next words are necessary inference from these. We will not fear. With God on our side, how irrational would fear be? How irrational fear will be for when we know that God is in control. When we are faced with situations we can either, as a Christian, respond one of two ways, panic or pray. And let's be honest, we focus on the former instead of heading to the latter. Can we be honest? Because that's what I do. And I don't know about you, I panic. But we need to learn to pray more and panic less. Oh yes, we can be nervous, and nerves are a good thing. Nerves means you care. But when a situation comes, when that loved one is rushed suddenly to hospital, we can panic or pray. I've known that within relatives of my own family. I can remember a great aunt of mine being taken to the hospital before my 21st birthday. And I went to see her on my 21st birthday and everyone said, oh, this is horrible, my God. And indeed it was, because I love my great aunt. But I prayed for her. And the Lord has strengthened her and she's well in her 80s now and wonderful she is you see God sees the end we only see part of it so pray to the one who knows the very hairs in your head when a troubling situation comes verse 3 even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea though its waters roar and be troubled though the mountains shake with swelling can you see the, the situation? Can you see this poetic psalm describes every situation of life, doesn't it? Who here has been shaken? Who here has felt the ground roar? Who has felt that troublesome sea hitting the face? Have you ever been walked by the sea and the wind and the water hits you in the face? Can I point out that this psalm is a psalm of the songs of Korah and they were the worship leaders of that time as a song of Almuth. Now that word 
is a, a, a musical key for sopranos, particularly female voices. So sisters, can you imagine this song being sung unaccompanied? It's beautiful. It stirs our affections for Jesus Christ more when we think about what he has done. Do you remember in the Bible, in the Sea of Galilee, Jesus slept in the boat and the seas were bad and the disciples go, Lord, do you not care? And he goes up peacefully still. And the disciples are, who is he? And the winds and waves obey him. Is there someone here this morning and you think God doesn't care about you? Well, let me tell you, he does care about you. Do you want proof? I can give you the best proof in the world. That's irrefutable, which is empirical. Look to the cross. 39 lashes save one. The very skin was ripped off him. He was mocked, betrayed, crucified. Look at the crucifixion. Look at that empty cross. Look to that empty tomb. That's how much he cares for you. So in the midst of your trouble, in the midst of that hopeless situation, and let me tell you, there is no such thing as a hopeless situation in the Christian journey. For there is hope. We have this hope. And his name is Jesus Christ. So whatever you face, there is hope. So when the earth feels like it's about to remove, when the mountains are carried, when everything seems to be a mess, know that the messenger is always in control. Always know. And I've known that in my own Christian journey. There is a river. There is a river whose stream shall make the glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. And there, I love this. Um, Spurgeon writes, and it's very applicable for our day. There are two phrases set forth in verse 3, and then this makes you understand verse 1 more clearly. The two phrases set forth the most terrible commotions within the range of imagination and include the overthrow of dynasties, the destruction of nations, the ruin of families, the persecutions of church, the reign of heresy and whatever else may at the time shry the faith of believers that the worst come to worst, the, child's, the child of God should never give way to mistrust since God remaineth faithful there can be no danger to his cause or people. We will not Fear what will come of Brexit. We will not be afraid of whatever happens to our promise. We will not fear. Instead, we will pray for our leaders. We will pray for Storm and Assembly. We will pray for Westminster. We will stop being a voice of criticism. We will be a voice of prayer. And a voice of prayer, that is where God has moved in the past. And that is how God will move now. We will pray for our leaders. We can read newspaper reports and listen to news reports and about c complaining about politicians. And in some cases, it might be right to do so. But church that stay, pray for them. Yes. For God has appointed everything. So let us pray for our leaders. Because if you want to see a state of a nation, then the state of the church. So what we need to do is go back to the source. To pray, to pray for our nation, to pray for its leaders, to pray for our security services, pray for the medical profession, pray for nurses, doctors, pray to be a voice of hope. Now you'll notice three words appear in this psalm. Sila means what do you think? To meditate, to ponder. And I pray you will do that this morning. What do you think? under the tempestuous trials but at times we very often speak in our haste and I am the guiltiest man in the world to do this we speak in haste instead of that laying, we lay our trembling hands accusing God of not being loving and there we can mar the melody of our life song however the good thing about the thing that the good thing about 
me, let me try and phrase this. I have dyslexia, so it's trying to phrase this clearly. What is marred can be cleaned. What is dirty can be purified. So if you have accused God this week of being unloving, unkind, and you think, oh, I can't come back to him, I really messed up here. God can clean you up. You don't clean yourself up, he cleans you. So let's go to thirst for, and you understand why I'm saying this now. There is a river. Now, let's remember what how beautiful rivers are when you walk past them. I love the noise of a river as the stream comes past. For me, it's so peaceful. I can forget about its trouble. I can forget about the world's trouble. I feel at peace. And it's not like some rivers in the Bible. Streams are not transcendent like Cherith, nor Mori like the Lyle, nor furious as the Kishon, nor treacherous like Job's deceitful brooks as you read in the Bible. Or spiritual place near are their waters naughty like those of Jericho. They are clear, cool, refreshing, abundant, and gladdening. The water that brings joy that comes from the source of living water, that whose name we worship and love, that is Jesus Christ. Amen. So there is a river whose stream shall make glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. The city of God. <coughs> the river of God. The water, the, in ancient times there was a great fear. Particularly in an eastern city in that time of war. Lest the water supply be cut off during a siege. If they were secured that the water was secured. They could hold out against a death attacks. And in this verse Jerusalem which represents us church in this instance is described as a well supplied with water to set forth the fact that in seasons of trial that his grace will be given to us to enable to endure it till the end and how great is it when jesus says lo i am with you always to the end of age if you believe that can you say amen, amen. no enemy can cut off the stream from the church of christ and you read isaiah 36 2 and Isaiah 37, 25, and compare it with 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verses 2 to 4. These gentle flowing but full streams are contrasted with the roaring waves of the sea. But let me let's end on verse 4 of this point. The city of God. Can I be your tour guide? Can Michael C. be your <laughs> tour guide? I love how Michael A. opened in prayer. Michael B. led a table. Now I have Michael C. A, B, C, one, two, three. I had to say it at some point, because someone would. So as well as a preacher out in the van says, I'll be your tour guide. Is that okay? Let me introduce you to the city of God. How can I get to the city of God? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is God, if you're justified through faith and not of works, if you repent of your sin and turn to Christ, if you seek him with all your heart, if you confess your sins and hold your sins in daily account to God, and follow him that's how you enter that is your passport that is your visa that is your set of citizenship secured in heaven as we write about or hear about in paul paul's letters to the church we have a citizenship in heaven you can't get to heaven based on your family you might come from a family of saints and i come from a mix of family of saints and sinners as we all do you're justified by him now, let me give you what some exact some uh, some beautiful points about this city of God. Jesus is there for one, and where He is, it's beautiful. This city is a place of security. It is a society who who have a beautiful fellowship. I love how the church can be a taste of heaven. How we love one another, forgive one another, encourage one another, serve one another, help one another. Are we like that this morning? It's a place of unity where they live in peace and in one accord, where war cease, where every tear will be wiped away. Isn't that beautiful this morning? It's a place of freedom and liberty, freedom from the guilt of sin, the wrath of God, the curse of the law, the present evil world, and bondage to Satan, etc. So everything evil of this world there is freedom in heaven. There is freedom in the church. 
a place of order and regularity, a place of rest, a place of splendor that no human imagination can ever imagine. My father received an OBE from Her Majesty the Queen in 2003 and as a child we walk into Buckingham Palace and see all the paintings and the splendour and the throne room but none of that can compare to one small ruby on his robe. And that is no disrespect to Her Majesty the Queen or to the, the history of Buckingham Palace or anything. Our imagination can never picture the splendor of heaven until we step there. Verse 5 God is in the midst of her, she shall not break, be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. It is given in, the, in some of our Bibles in the margin God shall help her at the appearance of dawn. There are two promises here McLaren writes in his commentary and I'd like to share them with you. There are two promises, so if you're taking notes, remember these points. The constant presence. God is in the midst. He is in the midst here this morning. If two or three are gathered in line, in line and I am there. Secondly, help at the right time. Notice the timing. He carries on to write, whether there be actual help or none, there is always with us potential help of God. And it has to be, and it will be, for he knows to be the right moment. And the appearing of the morning, or at the break of dawn, it says this, he writes this, Therefore we may be confident that we have God even by our sides, and he is there. It is he determines his help, not you or I. He comes at the right time, and God shall help her when the morning dawns. Verse 6. The nations raised, the kingdoms were moved, he uttered his voice, the earth melted. Can I share something? I love this phrase at the end. He uttered his voice, and the earth melted. The power of God melted the earth, and everything was still. And I want to come to that point later on. Verse 7, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. The Lord of hosts. Now, the Lord of hosts refers to the Lord of angelic armies. And we have the privilege of knowing its captain. It's Jesus Christ. So when we pray, when we know that the Lord of hosts is with us, we have the armory of heaven before us. So what shall we fear? Nothing. Because we have the captain on our side. J, uh, JFB, Jason Fawcett Brown, writes this, His presence is terror to our enemies and safety to us. Amen. So when Satan shouts at you, when the devil accuses you, just tell him of his future. It doesn't end well with him. I read the last page of the Bible. We win. End of discussion. It's not even up for discussion, it's a fact. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Now, my past, uh, the retired pastor of my church, Pastor McConnell, preached on the life of, of Jacob. And my heart went in my mouth because I was preparing this message. I just finished it for the prayer meeting later Friday of that week. And he says, Will you turn with me to Psalm 46? And I'm going, Ah, my servant is gone. And he goes, Sorry, Psalm 146. And I went, Oh, sigh of relief. <laughs> because when you read and you write and you see so much. And I'm thinking, oh dear. But he brought out so much from the life of Jacob. How he wrestled with God. How he stole Esau's birthright and who he became. And we look at who he was and who he became in God. There was a man, or a lady who asked Charles Spurgeon this question. I can't understand why God hated Esau. To which Spurgeon replied, Madam, I don't know how could God you could love Jacob. But nevertheless he did. And the God of Jacob is our refuge, and that God never changes. Because we have been told in his word that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you believe that, shout amen. 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 Shout out again. Verse 8. Come and behold the works of the Lord. Now, this is an invitation to see the works of the Lord. Can, I, can you accept this invitation this morning? Can I show you some of the works of the Lord this morning? Quite simple, I want to focus on one. 
Just one, one work of the Lord for today. Do you remember when God, when the Assyrians were encamped and 185,000 men had been smitten down in one night by the angel of God? That is one work of the Lord. The enemies of God will not triumph of the church of Jesus Christ. That is our promise. And he makes, who has made desolations in the earth, he makes wars to cease to, end of, to the end of the earth. And we have seen so many wars even in our province. But one day there will be a war that will cease. I remember as a boy, my grandfather, my grandpa Crossan, told me that he fought in the Second World War. He called me over, and I can still remember it to this day. I had my teddy bear in one hand. It was Grumman, actually, from Wallace and Grumman, if you can remember Wallace and Grumman. And he called me over, and he opened up this photograph album, and there was a picture of a young man, a rather handsome man, a band I'm biased, in a, in a uniform. And he goes, do you know who that is, Michael? No, Randa, I don't know. That's me. And I go, no, because you can't imagine your grandparents young, can you? Because you imagine, you know, that's, that's them. And he wrote to, on the back of this photograph, it's a picture of him in a uniform, to my father with love, John. And he told me all the funny stories of war. Never the horrors. And I remember saying to him as a boy, if there's never a world war again, Grandma, I'll fight like you. And he used to grab my hand and says, don't you dare, son. He wasn't a coward because he knew he took part in the last world war. Because Armageddon is coming. The world, the world can't keep going away, it's going. And he grabbed my hand and he said, don't do it. He wasn't a coward, far from it. He knew he fought in the last world war. And as I got older, and I heard about the battles he fought in. And I said to my dad, Dad, how could my grandma kept this people? Because I didn't know if I could have, because he fought in the battle of Nagadon's Pass and Benetton and all those places. He fought against the Japanese Imperial Army, and they were relentless. But he didn't. He clung to his faith. To, to which the, his regiment rebuilt the church that was destroyed by the Japanese, and the congregation were so moved by this. They erected a memorial to the friends that he lost. And I still have the order of service of the dedication of their new church building and a picture of the memorial and the prayers and the psalms that were read. But one day, wars will cease. Wars will cease. The bows and the cuts and the chariots will be cut down and destroyed. First hand. Be still and know that I am God. A familiar first if you're a Christian. It's a quote, first quoted often, isn't it? It's a Facebook post, a social media post, it's on coffee cups, journal bibles, posters, you name it. But do you truly know what it means? Well, firstly, be still comes from the Hebrew root rafa, which means to, to cast down, to let fall, to slacken, to leave the idea, to leave matters with God. I remember Pastor Carter Coleman from Times Square Church saying this, be still means shut up. <laughs> In other words, shut up. God can say to us, shut up. It's been a while since God, people have told us to shut up. Well, my mum and fiance might say shut up to me a few times when talking nonsense, but that's beside the point. Be still and know that I am To leave matters with God. We will carry these issues where we face in this in in church. And we do carry a lot with us, don't we? I don't want I don't like it how we put our church masks on. Let, let me explain my point. We we are a place of community, aren't we? So why do we put this church mask on? How you doing? I am great, I'm fantastic. Are you sure? Because I heard your loved one's not doing too well. And Oh, I'm fine, God is good all the time. <laughs> you cry, cry. That shouldn't be the case. I'm not doing well. Can you pray with me right now? And if there's someone here and you're struggling this morning, I would love to pray with you. I believe God can do amazing things and break through and help you. Because he's done it before and he'll do it again. To be still and know that he is God. And that he is God. Eliot's commentary writes this. The introduction of the divine protector. 
and you have a protector this morning who watches over you, who cares for you and loves you. And we know of his providence. There was a song last year, I went through a really rough season. A season where I didn't know my faith would survive. But God brought me through. And there was a song that became my life anthem. Can I read you out a few verses of this in the course, if that's okay? There is strength within the sorrow. There is beauty in our tears. And you meet us in our mourning with a love that casts out fear. You are working in our waiting. You are sanctifying us when beyond our understanding you are teaching us to trust. Your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. You're faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign over us. You are wisdom unimagined. Who can understand your ways? Reigning high above the heavens, reaching down in endless grace. You're the lifter of the lowly, compassionate and kind. You surround and uphold me. Your promises are my delight. Church, God is sovereign over us and he is sovereign over you this morning. Do you believe that? Amen. Only you can answer it. But Michael, I don't believe. Then believe it. I had a chat with a couple of brothers and sisters in this church. And I mentioned about my great uncle. He's 96 and he's not doing well now. He's now in a nursing home. He is, he is uh, one of the last surviving D-Day veterans in Northern Ireland. And he was saved just after the war. I remember once going through this rough time, I was on the phone to him, and he says, do you believe that you have a helper? More than that, he's your companion. And I go, I do. Then believe it. What he has said in his word, you believe it. And this, I know of all my heart, that this God that my great uncle still worships at 96, he was with him through his, he had a rough upbringing and he didn't have any shoes until he was in the army. He was in Borstal and he joined the revenge after his brother was killed in Norway and he got saved. He was a bit of, he, he got saved after placing a bet in the bookies. His unsaved wife led him to the Lord. He read this verse, prepare to meet thy God on the on the back of a of a wall of a church. A man Jane sees him and tear him up by a fire and she goes, What's wrong? as she was playing for her son. And my uncle Ronnie tells her what's going on and he, my aunt Jean, who's not saved at this point, goes, I think you need to get saved. An unsaved person leading the saved person to Christ, an unsaved person to Christ. He can't make it up. And then he leads her to Christ. And he serves the Lord faithfully. He stopped giving out gospel tracts in his 90s. I think it was 93. And he says it's a privilege to introduce people to Jesus. And it's my privilege to introduce you to Jesus this morning. I will be exalted in the earth. Sorry, I never said I will be exalted among nations and I will be exalted in the earth. Gillis write this, I will be exalted in the earth. Now Christ is exalted in heaven at the right hand of God. Before long, he will be exalted in the earth. The same place where he was despised and rejected, crucified and slain, he will be king over all the earth. And we have sang, glorify your name in all the earth. He is going to be king of all the earth. His dominion will be from one end of it to the other. His tabernacle will be among men and his people. As kings and as priests will reign with him on the earth. By whom he and he alone will be exalted in the dignity of his person and offices. Especially his kingly office as recorded in Zechariah chapter 14. Verse 9, if you have a Bible, you can read that up. And this consideration of which may serve to remove my fears and dismays of mine under present troubles, that he is in control. Verse 11, and I'm almost finished. I'm almost finished this morning. I want you to know something. A refuge at the beginning of this chapter and a refuge at the end. That is our God. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. There is a song in this season that has become my personal life anthem. When I don't know when my next next shift in next shift comes in the post office or where my next work will come in. 
or when this will happen, when that will happen, the plans I have. This song is my life anthem. I count on one thing. This same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now. In the waiting, the same God who never is late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh yes, I will. Yes, I will sing when I don't understand why, why I don't have steady work. Oh yes, I will sing when my loved ones are not well. Oh yes, I will sing when I don't understand what is ahead of me. I will be still and worship the King of Kings and know that He is sovereign, that is He, that is He is in control. I have a family of saints and sinners, but there's one more saint I like to quote that I was taught when I was young, when I was about 17. Mary Moore was her name. She died in 1996, and I was about four, yeah, I was four. And she lived until she was 106 and a half. Just few months she had her 107th birthday. At 101, sorry, she was asked this by an interviewer by Walter Love in 1989. She was asked this question. If you had to ask, if somebody, if you had to give something a bit of hope, a word for someone quite elderly, but this word is applicable for us. Who is lonely as around Christmas time this interview was given. She said this. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. My message was entitled The Song of Holy Confidence. And I pray that this message will stir up your affections, your love for Jesus Christ. Now make you consider where you stand with him. If you don't know him, you can come to him this morning. If you've fallen away from him, you can come back to him this morning. If, you're, if your confidence is gone, I pray this message would stir up your confidence, not in an egotistical way, because ego, my great, my uncle taught me this, he was a pastor, he taught me this, ego means edging God out. No, the way up in the kingdom of God is on your knees, seeking his face. I pray this message stirs up your holy confidence for the name and the purposes of the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Is there someone here this morning and you don't know the Lord and you need his strength? You need to know him as your Lord and Savior. Perhaps you've grown up in a church culture. Your family's Christian, your brother brought to church or even in some cases dragged to church, like I was at times. If that's you, or perhaps you've drifted from your faith, you've wobbled, you've made mistakes, and friend, you have made, we all make mistakes, we're human, but we have a God who is loving and merciful and forgiving, and you just look to the cross there, you'll see it. If that is you this morning, or if you've fallen away, or you just need him to touch you, well, you raise your hand, and I will see it, and I'll pray for you. Would there be one this morning? Would there be one? I always give an appeal at the service. Is that a hand I see? Thank you, I see your hand, you can take it down. Is there another one? Thank you, I see your hand, can you take it down? Thank you, there's two people, two people respond to the gospel. Is there someone else? I don't make my appeals long. Okay. We're gonna pray, and can I ask every Christian in the room to join me in this prayer? Is that okay, church? We're gonna to pray together, and you just repeat after me. I, I'm not gonna pray long, elegant words, I'm just gonna pray from the heart. And you pray this from the bottom of your heart. Okay? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I come to you. In the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who loved me and gave himself for me. I confess my sins to you. I repent of my sins. I look to you. I turn to you with all my heart. Help me to love you. Help me to follow you. Remind me that your mercy is near every day. You have a plan for my life. Lord, help me to follow it. Help me to love you more. I ask this, knowing that you'll keep me. 
know that you'll guard me. I know that you'll keep me. In Jesus' name. Amen. For those two people who respond to the gospel, will you speak to myself who sent me over here? I would just love to pray with you and encourage you. But for those two people who responded to the message, will you just give them a round of applause to encourage them? I pray if you don't have a church, I pray to make this church your home church. Or if you're part of a Bible believing assembly, that you'll be part because this is the first part of your journey. Because now you're following Christ. So I pray that the Lord will richly bless. Can I do a closing prayer before I hand back over the meeting? Can I just pray for this church? Is that so, if that's okay? Do I have your permission? Is that okay? okay. Heavenly Father, I just pray for Malayal Elam. And Lord, I thank you for the men and women who have planted this house in the beginning. And Lord, I pray that you will sustain it. Lord, you know its future. You know its uh, questions. You know what lies ahead for it. And Father, I just pray that you will provide, sustain, guide, and help. And I pray for the leadership team and all those involved in this house. I pray, Lord, that this church would be far too small. There will be a revival in this time. Lord, I pray, Lord, you will draw people in. But more importantly, Lord, as you said in the parable of the wedding invitation, that you will go out into the highways and the byways. And I pray that this church will be like that, that will go into the highways and byways, telling people of the good news of Jesus Christ and demonstrating that love to them. Amen. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless.